Morning folks, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School. And what I'd like to do today is delve a little bit into an updated video on the 10 C's of survivability to give you a little bit of a look into where my thought process is present day as far as each of these items within the 10 C's goes. And I've done lots of videos in the past on kit mentality. I did probably four videos on kit mentality over the course of a couple, three, four years. And now, eight to 10 years later, I want to give you my new thoughts or my present day thoughts on the 10 C's of survivability because I believe that to this day, it is the most viable and reliable and multifunctional kit that anyone can carry on a day-to-day -day basis in the wilderness to effectively tackle that inconvenient camping or emergency scenario. Stay with me. Morning folks, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self-Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School. And I'm in my front yard, actually right beside one of my instructor cabins out here at the Pathfinder School. And I've got a hammock strung up between two trees and it's a simple military surplus jungle hammock from the Vietnam era. But the beauty of a hammock like this is, A, it's very lightweight. It's simple in construction. It's only about four feet by seven feet with tubes on the end to feed either rope, paracord, or sticks through. There are several ways that you can set this up. You can set it up as a supported type hammock with sticks or you can just run paracord through it or some type of heavy cordage and string it up between two trees like I have it now. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about today was a little bit more in depth about a simple kit and simple 10C mentality. And I've used this 10C mentality for a long time and I've lived by it now for quite a long time. And I carry the 10Cs with me the majority of the time. And there are ways to build a kit with the 10Cs that don't have to necessarily cost an arm and a leg. And it's not really about the brand of the merchandise that you carry. It's about the pieces and parts of that kit meeting certain criteria for what you're going to be using them for and what you need. And that's what's important. The other thing to remember is that even though it's called the 10 C's, it doesn't necessarily mean 10 single items. That's basically 10 categories or types of items that you need to carry, especially when you're talking about the first five. So cutting tools, as an example, doesn't mean that you only need one cutting tool. Now the one that's on your hip that's attached to your body should meet certain criteria that kind of make it a one tool option if you were to lose everything else. But let's face it, how often are we going to lose everything we own? It's probably never going to happen to you. So the best thing you can do is be prepared. Pack yourself a small pack of emergency items. The one thing that does happen to people all the time, or a lot of times, is that they venture off into the woods unprepared. So they force themselves into that scenario of an emergency situation because they aren't prepared for the elements. They're not prepared for an injury that might have happened to them that kept them from getting out of the woods on time. They're not prepared to run out of gas in their ATV 15 miles in. Those things can catch you with your pants down very, very quickly. So those are the things that we want to prepare for with the 10 C's and the 10 piece kit. But it doesn't have to be extravagant. It can be very, very simple and it should be lightweight. So let's talk about that mentality real quick. Stay with me. Okay, one of the things that we have to realize in our own mind is that we venture into areas that aren't necessarily wilderness, but they are unfamiliar areas to us or areas that are not our home quite often. It could be a simple day hike with your kids in the middle of a state park somewhere on a four or five mile trail. It could be horseback riding through a national forest. It could be canoeing or kayaking down some slow, lazy river for the day. And something happens that keeps you from getting home. And what you need to understand is how do I turn that situation that could be an emergency into inconvenient camping? And that's important to understand. Now we're not going to carry as a rule all of the great accoutrements that we might have if we planned to camp. We probably aren't gonna have a tent, a sleeping bag, a ground pad, a full on hammock system with tarp, bug net, and all of that stuff that goes with it, the atlas straps. But we can carry some emergency gear that's very lightweight, that's not going to take up much room, and we can put it in a day pack 
for lack of a better word, a go bag, if that's the way you want to look at it, that we're going to take with us anytime we venture off the asphalt. If we're going out into the woods for any reason, we're going to take this pack of items with us and have it on our back. The chance of losing it are very, very slim. Your best chance of losing your equipment, really, in this day and age, in the type of things that we do, is probably if it falls out of a boat or a canoe or a kayak or something like that. But if you are traveling afoot or by ATV or by horseback or by Jeep or something like that, the chance of you losing your gear are almost none. Now, if you're going to be carrying that gear, we have to be weight conscious of how much gear we're carrying, and that's where the simple 10C mentality comes into play. Okay, so let's discuss our backpack real quick first because the backpack is the core of this kit. It's got to be long lasting and durable if it's something I'm going to use all the time. This is gonna be the bag that I'm gonna grab and go every time I'm going to the woods. Unless I'm planning to camp and I'm taking a bigger bag. But this is my day pack, if that's what you wanna call it. My go bag for every time I go to the woods I'm going to take this bag and I actually keep this one strapped to my Rokon. That way if I'm out, I've always got this with me. Now, the backpack itself, again, needs to be long lasting. It needs to be durable. Doesn't mean it has to cost a lot of money. All of the old writers like Thomas Seaton, Daniel Baird, Horst Kephart, Warren Miller, they all wrote in their books about the use of military surplus items for camping and tramping because they were built to last and they were heavy duty and they were readily available after the wars. So this pack is a German military pack and it's a German military rucksack. They're about $35 on Sportsman's Guide when they got them in stock. I actually got this one in trade. But what I like about the design of this pack is first of all, it's completely waterproof. I like that because now I don't have to worry about the gear getting wet inside. Number two, it's got one large bucket, and I'm a fan of the bucket pack. I don't want to have to search for things when I need them. I want to know exactly where they're at, and I want it to be quickly accessible in one simple spot. Not a whole bunch of little pockets everywhere I have to look through to remember where my stuff is. Now this one does have a sleeve on the back side of it, probably for some type of water bladder, but I generally just put a couple of quick emergency items in there, like an emergency space blanket and a drum liner. And that's pretty much all that goes in there. Most everything else goes in the main bucket. This one has two outer pouches on it that are just the right size for a 32 ounce water bottle. So I put a water bottle on one side and I put some quick grab gear on this side like tools and cordage. And then I put another water bottle on the inside if I'm going to carry two. And that really is dependent on where I'm going. Whether I'm just going to carry one water bottle and a nesting cup or whether I'm going to carry two water bottles and one nesting cup. This time of year, really, really hot. If I don't want to have to disinfect groundwater resources for the day, I'm going to take two water bottles for sure. And then if I have to do it, it'll be because it was an emergency. So this one also has pass-throughs on these pockets. So if you were going to carry an ax, which I wouldn't recommend if you weren't planning to be there, I would just carry a saw. You're going to be able to process plenty of wood for a fire for one evening or two with a saw. You'll be able to cut poles and things that you may need for shelter very easily with a saw, like a Baco Laplander. Those are very good saws to put into some type of kit like this because they don't weigh a lot, they work well, and they're long lasting. So that covers backpacks. An old Alice pack is a great pack. The old uh, Swedish and Swiss made rucksacks are all very good. And again, these German backpacks. It's got nice padded shoulder straps on it that are cotton. Again, it's waterproof. I just really, really like this style pack and this size pack. All right, so real quick, let's talk to cutting tools. And again, cutting tools are something that you can spend a lot of money on, but you don't have to spend a lot of money on them. They just need to work for the environment that you're going to be in. And in an emergency, you need to be able to trust those tools. A Baco Laplander folding saw, this one's probably five years old, and it still works just as good as it did the day I bought it, and it will process any wood that I need it to for an emergency fire or an emergency shelter. I have a small Swiss Army knife here that's got a couple extra tools on it, smaller blades that I keep razor sharp, as well as a pair of tweezers and a toothpick, so this becomes part of my first aid kit 
as well as just being another small extra blade and I keep that in my pocket. And then I have the Mora Garberg and the Mora Garberg, again, it's not a high carbon steel blade. So the only problem you're going to have with this is if you have to start a flint and steel type fire. But if you have that next fire mentality and you char material with your emergency fire, this will strike a ferro rod unbelievably well. And you'll be able to ignite charred material with that or the magnifying glass on your compass that we'll talk about in a little while, which gives you a lot of opportunities. So is this the perfect knife, in my opinion? Absolutely not. It's not a five inch blade. It's not high carbon steel. It does meet every other criteria. And if it's something I'm going to put in my kit and I don't want to have to do a lot of maintenance to take care of it, it's stainless and not carbon. So it's not going to rust. It's going to hold an edge longer. So I'm not going to have to sharpen it as often. So it does have merits in an emergency kit for sure. And I've used this knife a lot. Actually, this one's not even the prototype. The prototype's beat up worse than this one is. This is the second one of these that I've had. This is one that I picked up when I was in Sweden. But this is a really good utilitarian knife and it comes with a really nice sheath. And that's what I really like about it is it has this nice heavy leather sheath. I've got my sail needle taped to the back of it. It's got a nice security flap on it. It's not coming out of there on you. It's protected. It's not going to catch on anything. It's easy to get that flap open. It's easy to get the knife out of. And I'm a big fan of leather, so which is another reason I like this knife so well. But again, don't get hung up on brand. Don't get hung up on that because you can get a knife that will do everything you need to do very inexpensively. All you have to do is look around. Just remember what you want that knife to do and get used to using the tools that you have in your kit and you'll be fine. This is just one of the tools I choose to carry in mind. All right. Okay, let's speak to combustion devices real quick. I always carry three ways to start fire. And if I have these three things, I really don't feel I need anything else. I have a cigarette lighter, which gives me instant flame. If it runs out of fluid, it still has a sparking device that I can light charred material with. Next fire mentality. I can also scrape the body of this lighter to make a fire. And I've done a video on that before. If I have to make a last dish fire. It'll work if it's wet once I dry it out. It's very simple to do that. We teach that at the basic class. And it'll work if it's cold. All you have to do is warm it up. So it's a very good emergency tool for lighting fires. And they're very reliable and they're very durable. I always carry a heavy-duty ferrocerium rod. And this one has a copper stub or a copper cap on the end of it that's been glued on with Gorilla Glue. And I learned this trick from one of my past instructors named Chris Wick. And he put a copper stub in on his, and this is not a stub in, this is just a copper cap. But what it does is it makes this tool just a little bit more functional. Because if I don't have a way to strike this rod, I can find any broken piece of glass or hard rock, and I can use this copper as a bopper to nap that to a sharp edge so that I can then strike the rod. Because anything that's harder than this rod that has a good 90 degree edge on it will strike this rod. So it just gives you one more purpose that this rod will do besides starting fire. But a rod like this will last you a long, long time. And remember, with that next fire mentality, once you get this thing going the first time and you've made your charred material, it takes very little, if any spark, hardly at all on this thing to light charred material. So that makes this rod even longer lasting because you're not sitting there doing this over and over and over again to try to start your fire. You hit it one time and it's going to light that charred material. You use that with a bird nest or a tinder bundle and you're ready to rock and roll. The third thing is I always have a magnifying glass on my compass that's capable of igniting charred material. This is not the best magnifying glass in the world. It's not like a seven power or a larger magnifying glass that collects more light, but it does effectively light char and it will effectively light fungus like horsehoof type fungus. So it's good enough to start fires with if you have that next fire mentality. That gives me three ways to start fire, and this one is very multifunctional. We'll talk about that later as well. well guys, I really appreciate you joining me today for this segment in our short series on the evolution of the 10-piece kit. I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, and for our business. All of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.